وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم لا علم إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Inshallah, we, we've arrived at uh, Tabuk, which is in the ninth year of the Hijrah, and this Ghazwa uh, is extremely important for reasons, the least of which is that it was a definitive statement uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what differentiates the... Uh, the true believers uh, and those who are not. And this is one of the things that Allah mentions uh, about that, that it was a way of deciding who are the truthful ones and who are not. And there's going to be three people who are accepted uh, outside of all of the others that gave their excuses. And the reasons for their tawbah are made clear in Surah At-Tawbah, which is important because Surah At-Tawbah itself is the Surah of Jihad. And uh, Tabuk really uh, is the beginning of, of Jihad in a sense. Because uh, the nature of Tabuk was that unlike other Ghazwa, this was not to a small uh, group of tribesmen. This was not to a small uh, group of uh, Arabs who, although they were extremely... Uh, artful and um, apt at fighting uh, in the same way I think y y you can find the Native American in this country when the Europeans first came here the Native Americans uh, actually introduced the idea of, of guerrilla warfare to the, uh, to the Europeans Prior to that, the Europeans would just march into battles. Uh, and you had bright colors. The British were, wore extremely bright red. And then the opposite army would wear also bright colors. Uh, the the, the Na Native Americans in this country actually taught the Europeans that were settled here how to hide behind bushes and how to ambush and attack. And then they also became extremely adept at fighting on horses. Uh, in a way that the Europeans actually never mastered. So, in a sense, but, as you can see, it was the Native Americans that lost uh, because superior technology and also the fact that uh, the arts of war, uh, the studying strategy and the transmission of the martial arts is an ancient tradition. And the Europeans uh, have been very adept at warfare. If, if you study the history of Europe, uh, they are warrior people, and they have uh, they've mastered the art of war, or really the science. I think they lost the art, and they've mastered the science of war, of how to kill people. And nobody has been more successful, if you can call it success, nobody has been more successful than, than the Europeans uh, and prior to them, the, the predecessors to the Europeans, which are the Greeks and the Romans, at, at fighting. So, by directing this army, which in terms of uh, materialistic terms, if we look at the, the, the army that the Prophet ﷺ is taking out uh, on Tabuk, this is an army, despite the fact that they were never more prepared. In other words, the... the the men who set out for Tabuk were never more prepared than any other Ghazwa. They were, they were better armed than they'd ever been, uh, and, but they were heading towards uh, Romans, Europeans, uh, Benet Asfar, that's what they're called, the, the white people. And Benet Asfar 
they were not like the other uh, the other Arabs. Not only that, in the seventh year, they had just defeated. So this is two years after the 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 Roman victory over the Persians, and this was so. In other words, the, the Romans had an extraordinary victory uh, because initially the Persians actually uh, invaded. They took the crucifix from Jerusalem. They uh, they had actually reached Egypt. They had occupied uh, Syria. And then the Romans came back and rallied. Uh, and Romans, by Romans, it's really a Rome. And a Rome, uh, properly tra translated, would be the Byzantines. The Byzantines because it included Asia Minor, which is now present-day Turkey. Uh, but the Romans, Arumi, to this day, there are Arabs in North Africa, the older generations, that will refer to Europeans as Arumi, right? Arumi. So the, the Romans, uh, or the, the Rumis, the, the Europeans, um, were, were really, they just had a, a massive victory, and so obviously they were in a state of, uh, exaltation in terms of their military prowess and the Prophet sent them word that the Romans now actually feared uh, the Muslims and that they were preparing an army and according to some of the transmissions that the uh, Herakal uh, which is Heraclius was actually had given them a year's wages which is an important distinction also to remember that these soldiers, these uh, Ban al-Asfar, the Byzantines, these were paid uh, soldiers. This was a, a, a government's army. These were not like the Muslims, who were all volunteer. What they were promised uh, was Ihdar Husnayn, one of the two beautiful things. Victory and the spoils of war and the spoils go to the, to, to the victor, or uh, shahada. And so this was really, these were the only two reasons that anybody in those armies would have been fighting. Either uh, spoils, which would be weapons, uh, livestock, um, eventually it will come to be land as well, because uh, as land was con con conquered, uh, that was part of the spoils. But another thing to remember is the spoils was distributed by the Messenger of Allah. And so as we saw in the Battle of Hunayn, some people got a lot and other people didn't get very much. And even those in the end who got anything actually all gave it back. So really the reason these people are going out is, is Fisa Bilila. And I think Abu Khaythama uh, is the greatest example of that because he was actually one of the people that stayed behind. There were four originally. Now, they set out on this army. And the Prophet ﷺ, one of the things that he said is, تكفر, تكفر That Allah has promised to be the kafil, the one who will take care of Sham, which is this area in uh, what's called the Levant, Syria. It, it, it really means Syria a part of Jordan, uh, Palestine, and Lebanon. That originally was Sham to the Arabs. And it had to do with Sham, which is on the left side of the Arabs if they face the east, which is the sunset, and Yemen, which is Yemen, was on the right side. Sham was on the left side, right? Because the Arabs took a bad omen from the left side, Shu'ma, sh sh and a good omen, a Yemen, from the right side. So they... Uh, the Prophet ﷺ sent out. Now, many of the tribes were coming in uh, to go. But another thing to remember is that the other tribes who, who, who had not yet become Muslim, they're going to be saying, have you heard the Muslims are, are sending an army out to the, to the Byzantines? Now, the Arabs in their wildest dreams would have never thought about going up against the Byzantines. It, it was not in the frame of reference for the Arabs to think that they could go up against the Byzantines. It would be really the equivalent of uh, the Haitians thinking about invading America. Uh, I, I mean, really, it's in their 
psychology, it would have been a very similar type of analogy. You know, just people that literally had nothing and lived with the bare substance of life and, uh, you know, their concerns were goats and sheep and lizards and, uh, and scorpions. Right? That, that's what their concerns were. And, and the rich amongst them, who were the Meccans, right, their concerns were going once a year to Syria, once a year to Yemen, uh, and, and getting a few, buying some goods. They didn't even have, they didn't produce goods. There was nothing produced on the Arabian Peninsula. They had to go to Syria to get uh, Byzantine goods, and they had to go to Yemen to get Indian goods. They used to get Indian textiles and other things because there were merchants from the Yemen that would go to India and bring back uh, uh, those type things, which is why, like, Indian swords, Muhannad. In fact, the Arabs named their girls Hind, which was like now it would be the equivalent of calling somebody America or something like that, because Hind was this, you know, something from Hind was a good thing, like made in India. That, that really, I mean, it was that to the Arabs, it was made in India. You know, that was, a, and the Muhannad was the best sword that the Arabs knew of, which was a, a made in India sword. So this is, you know, things don't change. It's just places and names change. But the basic nature of life remains the same. Right? There are people that have power. There are people that uh, have the means of production. And, and then there's everybody else. Uh, and they are looking at those people uh, really bedazzled by them. And so really, by doing this, it's actually out, it's outrageous. <laughs> Only somebody who had absolute certainty with their Lord could do this. It really is. It is an outrageous thing to do. And, and one of the really interesting things is the hypocrites, they knew it was outrageous. <laughs> In fact, they said... You know, we can go to Beni Muspadak, we can go to Mecca, we can go Rome. In fact, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay said he thinks that, you know, that the Romans, this is like a lu'ba, that's the word he used. He thinks it's a game that we can go and, and, and fight the Romans. He said the Romans aren't like other people, right? In other words, they know how to fight and we're fools if we go up against them. So the Munafiqun... That was their perspective. The believers, sama'an wa ta'atan. If the Messenger of Allah says so, I mean, this is faith. It really is. You have to see tabuk is an act of deep faith. And that's the point of tabuk, is that these people had extraordinary iman to, to go out and really, uh, with absolute sincerity and belief, that they were doing something that was intelligent and, and possible. So the Prophet ﷺ, through Iman, was making what was impossible to the materialist possible to the spiritualist, to the person that believes in other than materialism. And, and that, is, that is one of the greatest gifts of the Messenger of Allah, is that he made the impossible possible. And, and Tabuk is really making the impossible possible. The idea that the Arabs could actually go and fight and conquer the Byzantines. And they will, and they would. And... Uh, and that's why in our present condition, we, you know, it's very significant for us, right? Because one, a couple of things to remember. The Prophet them, the last <coughs> act before he died was to send an army towards the Byzantines. Not towards Persia, not towards Africa, not towards India, towards the Byzantines, towards the Europeans. And he would say in a hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm not worried about Persia. They will have one nabha. A nabha is like the butt of a goat. Right? Nabha is a... They'll have one butt. And that's it. Then they become Muslim. And this is part of his nabuwa. And he said, But I'm fearful of the Europeans. They'll have one after another. And he said, Every time a generation of them uh, dies away, a new one will emerge to oppose you again. And he said, And they're not finished off until the hour. 
So this, this, uh, we're living this, right? It gives you goosebumps. You know, we're living it. This is it, the Romans. This is their Naphanel, like their most recent one in Iraq. And they're, and they're impressive. And the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, أَشَدُّ nas karra بَعْدَ الْفَرْ They are the quickest people to retaliate after they've uh, retreated. In other words, you know, look at the Germans, completely wiped out in World War uh, One and Two. After World War One, within a few years, they're the most feared army on the planet. And now, once again, they're the most dominant power in Europe after world, the complete devastation, right? The Americans in, in World War II put forth the most extraordinary war machine that was ever uh, created in the history of human civilization. And, and they went and they conquered Asia and uh, Europe. And, and the post-World War II world is the American world. And we're living the effects of that. But, right? the, the end, just, everything's going according to plan, right? So this is all part of the process. And, and that's why Tabuk is so important for us to remember. Despite the incredible odds, we have to believe in the wa'ad, the promise of our messenger, that it's true. And these, this is what these people did. And those who didn't were hypocrites. They're munafiqun. ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا الله نسمع شو only promised us delusion that's what that's their reality now there the three of these men كعب ابن مالك هلال ابن ميا and مرارة ابن الربيع the fifth the fourth one was أبو خيثمة now these three are the only ones that don't offer excuses which is an important lesson for the believers if you're if you do something wrong, be like our father Adam السلام, who gave us the sunnah of how to respond when one slips or, or slips up. In fact, when Ka'ab ibn Umadik came in to the Prophet وسلم, to, to ask permission not to go, in one riwayah it says the Prophet smiled at him with a smile of somebody who was upset. You know, and you can see that kind of you know, like, what are you doing? But it's still, he knew he was a believer, unlike the hypocrite. And the one he was most distressed about was uh, Abu Khaythama. Uh, Kaab was very young. He was, uh, Abu Khaythama uh, troubled him, uh, and, and he will actually, uh, later, uh, when he sees Abu Khaythama coming, he says, Kun Abu Khaythama. Um, Abu Khaythama, radiallahu anhu, uh, See, this was also a time the fruit harvest was just coming. So dunya, this was their dunya, because the Medanese people, their, their thing was their harvest. And this was, they're being told to go to something that sounds completely insane. From, from, from the materialistic Arab's perspective, this is an act of madness to go up against uh, the, the Byzantines. And... Uh, and on the other hand, at home, they have their harvest. There's no real threat from Bennett Asfar. It's only just things they've heard uh, about distant. And prior to that, one of the things that Herodotus and other historians have mentioned is that the, the, the Europeans, uh, actually, no one ever invaded the Arabian Peninsula. Abraha is the only person who, who invaded it from outside. Um, and, and there's a secret in that. Right. But nobody invaded. Alexander the Great got to the, uh, the steps of the desert and he turned his army back and he said, what a waste of time. You know, it's, it, there's nothing there. It's just sand. And that's part of the secret uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. So they really didn't, there wasn't a real serious immediate threat. This is kind of a preemptive strike and, 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 a, and a very outrageous one at that. So... They basically, uh, the Munafiqun don't go, and these men all come and they ask permission, and the Prophet ﷺ grants them permission. And a, a Bedouin come and they say they don't want to go either. So they set out. And um, one of the things that's really important also is the Prophet ﷺ gave the standard to Abu Bakr. And he actually put him in charge of the army to lead the army out of Medina, and he will come 
later. And he left Sayyidina Ali at home to guard his family. Now the Munafiqun said he just wants to uh, get rid of uh, Ali, that him having Ali with him. And this uh, is disturbed by it because this is the first time he's being told. I mean, he's the, Sayyidina Ali is Haydar, and he's the lion and, and the great warrior. And, and so he gets on his arm to meet the Messenger of Allah. And he actually, he tells him what they said. And Sayyidina Ali says, aren't you content to be like uh, Harun to Musa? Uh, so he's saying, you have a great maqam and don't, I'm leaving you behind. And, and that is an ishara because if you remember when Musa goes to the, uh, uh, to the mountain, he leaves Harun uh, behind to take care of Bani Israel. So just as the Prophet was leaving, he, he left him to take care of Bani Hashim, right, his own family. Now the, the ishara in this is important also because one, Abu Bakr has given the standard and he's placed in charge of the army, and two, Sayyidina Ali is left behind. For, this is a clear indication that uh, the spiritual authority of the Bani Hashim is, is rested in Sayyidina Ali. And, and they will produce many, many great uh, scholars and imams, the, the Ba'alawi, uh, all of the great early seda from them, Ja'far al-Sadiq, uh, Musa Kalvin, uh, Muhammad Baqar, all these people will come out of Bani Hashim, Muhammad Nafs al uh, some of the great Mujahideen as well, the uh, Idris al Akbar wal Asghar, who go to Morocco and uh, found the uh, Adarisa dynasty. So, and one of the things that Hassan told his brother Hussein when he, t he, he told him, don't go up against Muawiyah, he said, Riyasat. رياسة الدين والدنيا لا لا تجتمعان في 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 هذا الأهل. That the the leadership of Deen and Dunya are not going to come together in this family. That's what that was his advice to Hussein. You know, in other words, we should be content to have رياسة الدنيا. And one one of the things that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, إن القرآن والسلطان سيفترقان. فديروا حيث دار القرآن. That the Quran and government are going to go separate roads at a certain point in this deen. And the Prophet said, so go with the Quran. Right. Now, uh, Abu Khaythama, who comes at a certain point, they, they've marched on. And they've gone out for over a week. And Abu Khaythama comes to, uh, he's just been out working, and he comes, it's very hot, which was another reason, like the Munafiqun were saying, let's go later when it's cooler. And so the Munafiq is somebody who, like they'll say, oh, let's, let's wait till it gets cool. And then when it's cool, they'll say, you know what, it's too cold, let's wait till it gets a little warmer. So they're always looking, uh, they always have this excuse, a way out, that's what we call it. They always have a, a contingency plan, like, right? This is what people to hire lawyers for, which has become the science of nifaq. The lawyer, is, he finds that, that hole to get you out of, right? The loophole. And that's really what the munafiq is. He's always got the loophole. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ accepted their, their pathetic excuses. He didn't, he didn't judge them. He just accepted their excuses. Abu Khaythama goes in, and he's, he's had two of his wives, they had uh, Arisha, which was like a, with vines, and uh, uh, it was a, a place to protect you from the, s the sun. And one of the things that the Arabs would do is they would pour cold water on it. Now you might wonder, what, how, where do you get cold water in the hot desert? Well water is extremely cold. And the girba, the qirba, which is what the Arabs kept their water in, it is amazing that even in the midst of the hottest day, that uh, leather container will keep that water cold. The water, like in Mauritania, in the middle of the desert, the hottest day of the year, you can get, it's like uh, water that is like refrigerator water. So what they would do is they would take that water and they would spray it over the, uh, the, the vines of this Arisha, and it would create like an air condition uh, environment, right? So you would go into this and it'd be all cool and outside it'd be hot. And then they had food prepared for him and he comes in and he looks at these two women and he looks at this, uh, he's got this air-conditioned uh, 
<laughs> veranda and they've got the food laid out and he says, Abu Khaythama is going to be here with these two beautiful women, all this food, this, this feeling cool and the messenger of Allah is in the midst of the heat of the desert going to jihad and he swears an oath that he won't step into those until he sees the messenger of Allah. So he sets out very fast, comes up to the Prophet Sallallahu and the, when the Prophet saw him from a distance, he said, Kun Abu Khaythama, be Abu Khaythama. He knew, see this is the thing, the messenger of Allah, that's why he was so uh, struck by the fact that Abu Khaythama would have uh, taken an excuse not to go. And so when he came, the Prophet rebuked him, and then he told him what had happened. And, and why he couldn't be back in Medina. And the Prophet Sallallahu prayed for him and blessed him. So what they do is they go to Tabuk and they stay 20 days, nothing happens. So this is really interesting. It was a test of these people who really thought that there was probably a very high probability that they would not be returning to Medina. And, and they go there and they actually... Uh, sa sacrifice and eat and uh, nothing happens. And not only that, uh, they have Yohanna, who's the uh, uh, Christian ruler of uh, an area there, Ela, comes and actually gives tribute to the Prophet and, and enters into an allegiance with him that they will pay jizya. So this is also the beginning of the Christian acceptance of Islam in uh, Sham. So there are very significant political uh, events about this. And there's other uh, uh, people that come from that area and also enter into alliance. Now at that point, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Khadid ibn Walid, um, takes 420 horses to Dumat al-Jandal, which is just to the northeast, and actually comes upon Ukaidr, who's a Christian ruler, <coughs> And he uh, takes him prisoner. And he becomes Muslim. So now this is also the beginning of the Christian uh, direction towards uh, da'wah amongst the Christians and spreading Islam amongst the Christians. Because the pagan Arabs have by and large been subdued or vanquished and, and most of them have now entered into Islam. And this year is going to begin what's called the Amr Wufud, which is the beginning of the year of all of the... Um, when they begin to send all of these people, uh, send their um, what, what? delegation, the, the year of the delegations, where they send the delegations and uh, they begin to enter into uh, allegiance with the Messenger of Allah. Now, at this point, the Prophet Sallallahu says to his, um, his inner sanctum, he says, should we continue on into Sham? And and Nujahidahum fi qa'ri darihim. Should we keep going and take over Syria? Now again, you see, this is a man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who's been promised by Allah to have Syria. He knows it's his. He's saying, Should we do it now? And Omar says, Ya Rasulullah, is this wahi or is this ra'i? Is this revelation? Again, you see, they're they're not questioning the wahi, but they're questioning <laughs> The personal opinion, you know, is this wahi or is this revelation? Uh, is this opinion? And the Prophet said, it's ra'i, you know, it's my opinion. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, let's go back to Medina and when we get stronger, we'll come back and do it. And Omar will do the job. You see, Omar will do the job. Right? Allahu Akbar. So, but the point is, I mean, you can see... The Prophet and this is Yaqeen. This man is a man in a complete state of Yaqeen. He has no doubts whatsoever. And, and, and history, history is, testifies right, to, to his certainty, that his certainty was justifiable and correct. So uh, when he comes back, interesting thing, again, like returning from Badr, because Tabuk really is a great victory. It's a victory against the hypocrites. It's a victory of the believers who've gone out, because they get the reward of jihad, because they went out with Niyat al jihad, um, and they didn't uh, lose, they only gained. When he comes back, uh, the beloved daughter of the Prophet, Um Kulthum, has died. And he tells Sayyidina Uthman, if I had another daughter, I would marry her. 
to you, another daughter who wasn't uh, already married, which is also an indication of the maqam of Dhu Nurain. He's called the possessor of the two lights because he had the two daughters of the Messenger of Allah. Now, another thing which he does not mention, which is a really important event, 